We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High life, we advance. The people of God um, are separ separated by their nature and, and character, which is like his. We're separated by presence. And we're separated by being mandated to bring the government of the kingdom of heaven to earth. And that is what we're going to explore today. So let's just go back um, and remind ourselves of the journey of man and, and just where it all began briefly. Um, we know well in... in uh, Genesis 1, 26, that uh, the Lord said, or the Godhead said, let us make man in our image and, and likeness. And, he, and, and that was done. And the Lord gave uh, some, some instructions and some mandates uh, to, to man. So made in his image, like him. So the character uh, was already taken care of. The nature and character of God was what man had in the beginning. Um, they, had present, they had his presence because at the cool of the day, the scriptures tell us there was a, 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 continu there was a fellowship that they enjoyed with the Lord. Um, the Bible tells us that they were naked and not ashamed. Uh, and, and there was just that liberty <clears throat> before him that they enjoyed uh, in the garden. And of course, in terms of government, they were instructed to have dominion. They were instructed to have dominion that was God's clear mandate, and he spoke it to them right at the beginning. And you know, the, the word dominion is a Hebrew word, rador, and it speaks about subjugating, prevailing against, and ruling over. So the position of this man that was created in relation to his territory was very clear. Um, if they were in charge, they were placed in charge, and it, if there was no uh, scope for resistance, then the Lord would not have told them to have dominion. He wouldn't have told them to prevail over. He wouldn't have told them to, to, to subjugate, to rule. You know, you can't rule if there, there are no subjects. You can't have dominion if there's nothing uh, uh, that you have conquered. So, so this was intrinsic in the initial um, 
you know, mandate of, of, of man. We can think of it like a colonizing mission in the same way that we've seen it in the natural, that, that a, a monarch uh, sends uh, people to, to another territory uh, to, to, to take that territory for, for them. Um, you know, the, the nation which I'm speaking from, we've experienced that. We were colonized by the British. And there are many, many other nations of the earth that have been colonized. And they answered to the crown of the, of the country um, that had sent the colonizers once they had been, uh, once they had been prevailed over. Um, so this was what, the, the, what man was mandated to do in the beginning. And you know, the context in which they were doing that was, was having the character and nature of God, having perfect fellowship with him, being free uh, with him and before him, being naked and not ashamed. It was in that context that the, uh, the, the instruction to have dominion uh, was given to them. So as we also know, uh, some things went wrong. You know, we, we know the story. They were outwitted by the one that they were supposed to rule over, really. They were outwitted by the serpent uh, who deceived them. And basically, they ended up surrendering the nature that they had, that was the nature of God, and, 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 and being deceived into uh, taking on the nature of, of, of the enemy, the na nature of Satan. So, so in this context, they, they no longer enjoy that uh, freedom. We know that the scriptures tell us that they hid once, they, once the Lord came to draw near to them. So there wasn't that, uh, that, that the nature that they had uh, had given them a certain image of God that meant that they were unable to, to draw near to him and unable to fellowship with him. Um, and they were in a state that that if it was perpetuated, would have been uh, a disaster for, for them and for, for all that, that uh, would come after them. So the Lord removed them from his presence. You know, in, in Genesis 3:22 and 24, um, you know, the Lord tells them, after outlining the consequences of their actions, that they, were, they, they had to leave his presence. And, you know, for those of you that have been following us for some time, you know, in the, in the series that we did some time back this year, um, the way of Eden. Um, you know, we were taught that Eden was not a physical location on the earth. It was a place in God. It was a, it was a, a state of being and, a, and a, a place of communion and fellowship with God. And it was from that place that uh, man, Adam and Eve, were supposed to advance and, and have dominion, you know, on the earth. So once they could no longer be in that place, uh, you know, the Lord had already made it clear to them that uh, you know, the, the, the dominion that they were supposed to have, they would be unable to have it. That, that, that it would be with great struggle that they would live on the earth. It would be with great struggle that the ground would produce for them. It would be with great struggle that they would produce, uh, that the woman would, would give birth or produce anything. So without the nature and character of God and without the presence of God, it was impossible for them to, to have dominion. It was imp impossible for them to govern the earth. But the good news is that there is no word of the Lord that returns to him void. So even if the serpent had outwitted uh, Eve uh, and, then, and then Adam had, had sort of not taken responsibility and they'd ended up in the position that they had ended up, uh, he certainly had not outwitted God. Isaiah 55, 11 tells us clearly that there is no word of the Lord that returns to him void. And that which the Lord intended, and that which he intends, uh, he will have. So the Lord just begins to execute his, his plan of restoration uh, you know, for man.
there's uh, another Adam. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it gives us fresh hope that, you know, we're back on track. Um, and the good news is that it, he didn't come as a solo agent. Yes, there was one Adam uh, and, and Eve, and of course they were supposed to produce, but, but he comes uh, as the last Adam, and, and, and he makes clear to us that, uh, you know, he is making a way for, for us also to be like him. In, in, in John chapter 1, verse 12, the scriptures tell us that they that received him, he gave the authority to become children of God. Uh, and in Romans 10, verse 8 and 9, we are, we, are, we are told that, you know, if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths uh, that, that Jesus is Lord, uh, that we will be saved. Romans 8, 29 tells us that for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the whole point of this son of God coming was uh, the, the end game was uh, uh, for, for us was that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. So many would come after him. So there's a, there's a second Adam, one that uh, did not fail any tests, uh, and one that, that has the nature of God and, 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 and the presence of God. Uh, so it looks like we're back in business. It's something to, to rejoice about. Um, so, so the question then is, since we have uh, a way to be restored to his nature and character and his presence, um, then what about the dominion or the government? 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 tells us, uh, in chapter 4 particularly, tells us that as a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price so that you, through the power of these tremendous promises, you can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. So the way has been made for us to have the nature and character of God. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 uh, that don't you realize that together with Together you have become God's inner sanctuary. Don't you realize that together you have become God's inner sanctuary and the spirit of God makes his permanent home with you. Romans 8 verse 11 says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who has raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we've been restored or at least we have a pathway to restoration in terms of character and nature. We have the presence of God living on the inside of us once we receive him. So it reads thus, Simon Peter spoke up and said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. So, you know, this, these words were uttered in, in the context of, you know, a conversation. Jesus asks, who do, who do people say that I am? So, so what, what can we glean from these verses? Well, first of all, um, it starts with the revelation of Christ. So Jesus is asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, some say, some say, some say. Um, and then he asks them, who do you say that I am? And Peter says that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, the, the word church is actually derived from the Greek word kuriakos, and it means belonging to the Lord, to Jehovah or to Jesus. And it may surprise you that the word kuriakos only appears twice in the New Testament, which is interesting because, you know, it's in the New Testament that the church emerges. Uh, that which was uh, hidden becomes revealed uh, uh, in the New Testament. But that, the word church, or the word kuriakos rather, only occurs twice. And, it, and, and it's used firstly uh, in relation to the Lord's Supper, as in belong, the supper that belongs to the Lord. Uh, and, and it's used in Revelations 1 to speak about the Lord's day. Um, so as in the day belonging to the Lord. So it, it really refers to things, uh, something that belongs to the Lord. Um, and the word has really made its way through uh, you know, generations in different languages and, and, and sort of been adapted, transliterated really. And we now have the word church. And that church, that word church has this association with it. So it describes the form of something. It really despi it describes a the gathering of a people that belong to God or, or perceived to belong to God. And, and it's, it's associated in that mentality. If we think about church, gathering, people, coming together, it, 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 it kind of conjures up uh, meetings, it conjures up uh, uh, worship, sermons, you know, singing songs, prayers, um, benevolence, you know, outreach, places of refuge and, 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 you know, a place that you can go if you, if you need solace or peace uh, or you're in crisis. And the word actually that, that uh, was used in that passage, in that first mention uh, that, we, that, we, that we currently read as church in our, in our English Bibles, 
The word is actually ekklesia. Um, it's a Greek word, and it means legislative assembly or selected ones. It's not, it was not a religious term at all, but, but a political and governmental term that was prevailing uh, in the time that Jesus spoke. Um, I think, uh, and you know, it, it was really a group of people within the Greek governmental context uh, that, that had uh, the highest authority over the affairs of a city. So, um, you know, there would have been a, an ecclesia in, in, in Thessalonica. There would have been one, uh, I, I should say actually, that, that system of government went beyond the Greeks. So it was adopted in Roman times and, and so on. So um, each city would have had an ecclesia. Thessalonica, Colossus, Ephesus, there would have been a, a, a governmental arrangement in, in those cities uh, that the disciples would have understood. And, and I guess the question is, you know, if uh, you know, the Lord wanted to speak about a gathering, there are actually many other words that he could have used uh, in that time. He could, have, he could have used the word synagogue, um, which, of course, is... Uh, a word that they, that they understood and, and, and something that was very familiar in the context of their culture, even as, as Jews. He could have used the word panagurus, uh, which is a word that was used at the time, and it speaks of a general assembly or a mass meeting. But he didn't use any of those words. He used the word ecclesia. Um, and, and, and given, you know, uh, the options that he had, we have to, to ask ourselves ourselves why. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I also spoke about, you know, in those verses, the Lord makes clear that there is, um, there is there's opposition to this ecclesia. Uh, he says the gates of Hades will not prevail over it. And, and that suggests to us that the gates of Hades will try. It suggests to us that the, the, the gates of Hades will try, that there will be contention, that there will be confrontation. You know, in order to, 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 to have dominion, in order to, to, to rule over something, in order to subjugate something, uh, the, the implication of that kind of language is that there is uh, one who is an authority and there is one who uh, is resistant to that authority or seeks to supplant that authority. So, so Jesus is, is, is speaking to his, his uh, disciples. He uses the word ecclesia, which, we, which means a legislative assembly. He chose that word above many other words that he could use, and he spoke about the gates of Hades not prevailing over uh, uh, his ecclesia, his legislative assembly. Um, now, clearly, uh, this legislative assembly was not for the heavens, it was, the, it was for the earth. Uh, I think it, it, we, we can all accept that there's no debate about whether or not the gates of Hades can prevail over uh, the, the, the kingdom and the throne of heaven and the government of heaven. That is not you know, something that's in dispute. So it's clearly uh, the, the attempt at, for, of Hades to, to prevail over this ecclesia or this legislative assembly or this governing and governmental arrangement that Jesus is speaking of has to be referencing a realm in which that is even a possibility, which brings us um, to, to the earth. So let us just even look at the kinds of things that uh, legislative assemblies did uh, in those days, uh, the kinds of things that ecclesias did in those days. Uh, when we consider that Jesus chose that word. Um, so William Barclay, a biblical scholar, explains, uh, talks about the ecclesia, and he says that, you know, in that day, um, you know, within the, the scope of the law of the land uh, that was prevailing, they had pretty much unlimited power. They, they elected and dismissed magistrates. Uh, they made policy to govern the city. They declared war and made peace. They contracted treaties and arranged alliances. They elected generals and military officers and was responsible for the conduct of those officers. So they were responsible really for, for, for war and the execution and prosecution of wars. Uh, and they raised 
and allocated funds. Um, clearly, this is not a word that speaks of anything that is, that is limited to ceremonial duties. It's not, it's not limited to uh, benevolence or, or relief. It is proactive. It is, it is, it is outward looking. You know, when we think of a church, we think of a, a place that people come together uh, in. We think of a community that people join. We think of a place that people come when they need help or when they have some emergency or when they're in distress. But when you, when you think of an ecclesia, the ecclesia understands a, a responsibility that they have. They understand a power that they have. And that activity is outward looking. You know, you're looking at the affairs of the city or the domain over which you have authority. You are taking responsibility for it. You are identifying threats. You know, it says that, uh, you know, they declared war and made peace. So to declare war means that you must identify, you know, where there is a challenge or a problem uh, or an incursion. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if engagement has failed, then you declare war and you take action and you deploy the, the military apparatus that, uh, that you have in your custody to prosecute that war. Uh, you, you raise uh, finances and deploy them. You know, you, there's resources and, and stewardship of resources uh, in, in, uh, in looking out for the affairs of the city fell within, uh, you know, the, the, the domain of the, of the ecclesia. Making policy is a very proactive thing. You know, what is the healthcare policy? What is the education policy? What is the, uh, uh, you know, social welfare policy? You know, what is the developmental policy of this city? All of those things fell within the purview of the ecclesia. And Jesus used this word as opposed to a synagogue or a word that describes a town square or a festival or many other words that could reference a gathering uh, in that day. And he did not use the word from which the word church is derived. It says, verse 11, at this time, Jesus was getting close to entering Jerusalem. The crowds that followed him were convinced that God's kingdom realm would fully manifest when Jesus established it in Jerusalem. So, that, so you know, Jesus is going to Jerusalem 
Um, they're thinking, yes, 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 it's showtime. You know, he's going to go and he's going to he's going to upend everything. He's going to take over, uh, and and we're going to and and you know he's 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 the king of the Jews, and, and they're going to he's going to demonstrate that he's the one who's really in charge. Um, he says so. He told them this story to change their perspective. Once there was a wealthy prince who left his province to travel to a distant land, where he would be crowned king and then return. Before he departed, he summoned his 10 servants together and said, I'm entrusting each of you with $50,000 to trade with while I'm away. Invest it and put the money to work until I return. Some of his countrymen despised the prince and sent a delegation after him to declare before the royals, we refuse to let this man rule over us. He will not be our king. Nevertheless, he was crowned king and returned to his land. Then he summoned his 10 servants to see how much each one had earned and what their profits came to. The first one said, the first one came forward and said, Master, I took what you gave me and invested it and, and it multiplied 10 times. Splendid, you have done well, my excellent servant. Because you have shown that you can be trusted in this small matter, I now grant you authority to rule over 10 fortress cities. 10 fortress cities. The second came and said, Master, what you left with, left with me has multiplied five times. His master said, I also grant you authority in my kingdom over five fortress cities. And another came before the king and said, Master, here is the money that you entrusted to me. I hid it for safekeeping. You see, I live in fear of you, for everyone knows you are a strict master and impossible to please. You push us for a high return on all that you own. And you always want to gain from someone else's, someone else's efforts. The king said, you wicked servant, I will judge you using your own words. If, that is what, if, if what you said about me is true, that I'm a harsh man pushing you for a high return and wanting gain from others' efforts, why didn't you at least put my money in the bank to earn some interest on what I entrusted to you. Uh, and, you know, I think we, we know basically how uh, that ends. Verse 26 says, you replied, yes, replied the king, but to all who have been faithful, even more will be given them. And for the ones who have nothing, even the little they seem to have will be taken from them. Now bring all those rebellious enemies of mine who rejected me as their king, bring them before me, and execute them. You know, I, I've, I've found it, it, it's curious that that parable begins with an expectation that Jesus was going to declare his kingship. He was going to go to Jerusalem and take over as king. So the people that were following him were looking at a physical realm and they were thinking, this is it, it's showtime, you know, Caesar will be deposed. Uh, and, and, you know, Jesus will, will take the throne and his kingdom reign will begin. And he then gives them a parable to help them to understand or to change their perspective. And he speaks about uh, uh, those that he has called, his servants that he has called, who he has given resources to. And he has told them to, to, to trade until he comes back. You know, in other translations, it says, occupy until I come. Which is, you know, I, I guess a line that we're much more uh, familiar with in, in the context of this parable. Occupy until I come. So he goes off, uh, is crowned king uh, in his land and comes back. So if we, if, we, if we think of this as, you know, Jesus uh, wants them to realize that his, 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 his domination uh, in the way that they're expecting it is not going to happen now but he's leaving some people behind to attend to his affairs uh, and, to steward, and, to, and, to, and to, to steward resources that he has given to them uh, uh, whilst he's away. And when he has been crowned king, he will return and then he will come and evaluate what they have done. And those that have stewarded uh, what he gave them well, he said, I make you ruler over 10 fortress cities and make you ruler over ten, five fortress cities. And the one that felt that he had nothing and, and lived within a very small confine, 
and, and felt that he just needed to present himself in a manner that uh, no fault perhaps could be found with him and he could give back just what he had been given with no increase, uh, was cast out and, and set aside. I, and I found it fascinating that, um, you know, Jesus was basically trying to help us to understand that the vastness of what is to come uh, uh, remains. But that which I've given you to do now is correlated with that. It doesn't say in this parable that, you know, basically they, they, they traded with uh, uh, what he gave them. And, and it became so much they were able to take over the whole city. But they were faithful with what they had been given. The one who had been given five had ten. The one who had been given uh, five, sorry, the one who had been given ten got another ten. The one who had been given five got another five. And the, 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 the relationship between that good stewardship, that stewardship that he was pleased with uh, uh, and, and what he says when he returns is to give them greater responsibility of stewardship but of cities. So stewardship of cities further down the line uh, is linked to the establishment of, of the kingdom, the kingdom, uh, uh, the, the kingdom that they were expecting to happen now. So what the Lord is asking us to do now is not to, to, to take over the world such that there is no evidence of, of any kind of life outside of him. We all know that you know, not everybody will receive him, even though he has made provision for everybody to, to receive him. We all know that not everybody will be saved, although the provision has been made for that. But that is not an excuse or a reason for us to shrink back and say, well, it's all too much. It's too, too much of an ask, and therefore, you know, we're going to stay within the confines of what we consider to be safe. You know, we may think that uh, that which we're doing as, as uh, ecclesia in this temporal, or that which we're called to in this, in this temporal realm is of no consequence. But the truth is that laws shape society. They shape culture. They uh, determine norms and things that are abnormal. You know, that when a law is made that says that children, for example, are indoctrinated uh, through an educational system uh, with, with, with falsehoods that, that, that lock their hearts uh, from truth, 
then we can see clearly that the laws of the land have a, a, a repercussion on, on, on eternal destinations. You know, when you have laws that basically say that the word of God cannot be preached, when you have laws that say that uh, uh, the expression of, of, of God and, and, and of faith in God is prohibited, then great darkness enters the land. And there are people that will be lost eternally because the light of God was not seen. There's a reason why the Lord tells us in Matthew 5 that we should be salt and we should be light. There's a reason why he says uh, that we are as a city set on a hill. That our light shines and gives uh, 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 you know, illumination to, 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 to men so people can know how to, to go about their lives. And a city, by the way, in that time would have had uh, an ecclesia. So there's a city, there's, a, there's an arrangement of living that is ruled by heaven, ruled by those who, uh, the parameters of which are set by those who have the character of God and the nature of God. They have, uh, they have, they have his presence operating in their lives. There is an expression of that that gives light to men, that gives hope to men, that causes people to know that even though darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the people, they see a city on a hill. There is a light that has arisen, that is shining, that they can point to, that they can ascend towards. And those of us that have received Christ as our Lord and Savior, those of us who have had our, our that have been redeemed and are being redeemed, those of us that carry the presence of God, those of us that have access to heaven, 